So for the past couple of lessons, we've derived general formulations of the continuity and momentum equations. However, we haven't really looked into some of the more detailed equations, such as Euler's equations and Bernoulli's equation. So in this video, we're going to derive Euler's equation in the differential form. We've already derived this equation using the integral formulation, but now we're going to start by using the general momentum equation in its differential form. So let's review a little bit about what we have here. We have our three momentum equations in the x, y, and z directions. We know that the momentum equations depend on the stress tensor. And we know that the stress tensor consists of normal and shear stresses acting on each face of your fluid element and in each of the three dimensions in x, y, z space. We also know that the velocity of a fluid element is a vector that consists of x, y, and z components that are named u, v, and w, respectively. So if we look at our momentum equation, we see that we have a normal stress component and two shear stress components. In the case of the z-direction momentum equation, we also have the gravitational force expressed. And we get that the sum of the forces acting on the fluid element should be equal to the density of the fluid times the material derivative of the velocity components in the x, y, and z direction. So how do we take these three very long, very complicated equations and then use them to find Euler's equation? Well, we need to first figure out or we need to first think of what was Euler studying. Euler's assumptions included in viscid flow, which means that we don't really have to consider viscous effects. If we are not considering viscous effects in fluids, then we don't really need to consider the shear stresses acting on a fluid element because the shear forces will be neglected. So if we look at our stress tensor and we decide to neglect all of the shear stress elements, then we're going to end up with a stress tensor that only consists of three normal stress elements. Now, what does that look like in our equations? Any term that has to do with the shear stress tensor can be canceled out of our momentum equation. Therefore, our x momentum equation will have only two terms, a normal stress term and the density and the acceleration in the x direction. Our y direction equation will have two terms, our normal stress term and the density times the acceleration. And our z equation will have three three terms, a normal stress term, the gravitational force term, and the acceleration in the z direction. So let's go ahead and start rewriting a little bit to see what our stress tensor looks like. Since we're canceling out all of our shear stress components of the stress tensor, then our stress tensor will consist of only normal stresses, that is sigma xx, sigma yy, and sigma zz. But then what does the sigma term represent? We know that a normal stress acting on a fluid element is actually equivalent to the pressure acting on that fluid element. That means that the normal stress acting on our element should be related to the pressure on that wall. We've already derived back in our first or second lesson that we've already determined that if our fluid element is very, very, very small, then the pressure should be equal in every direction in that fluid element. That means that for our infinitesimally small fluid element, all three normal stress terms should be equal to the pressure acting on the fluid element. So we can rewrite the pressure term into the stress tensor. Now we also know that pressure always acts into our fluid element into our control volume therefore we will add a negative sign that represents the pressure acting into our element so keeping this stress tensor in mind we can now rewrite a form of the momentum equation that is more in line with our inviscid flow assumption in the x term we will have the partial derivative of sigma xx with respect to x, but we know that sigma xx is simply negative pressure. 
we cancel out all of the shear stress terms and we get that this is equal to the density times the material derivative of the x component of the velocity. In the y direction, we have the partial derivative of the normal stress component acting on the y face, but we know that that is the pressure. So we can rewrite in the equation as follows. And in the z direction, we will have the normal stress component acting on the z face. And we will also have the gravitational acceleration force. So following our inviscid flow assumption, our momentum equations will turn into these three simplified equations with less terms. Now we can rearrange and write this equation in vector form. So in order to do that, let's express the gravitational acceleration g as a vector. So I'm going to define my gravitational acceleration vector as simply negative gravitational acceleration times a unit vector in the z direction. The negative represents the gravitational acceleration acting downwards in the z-axis because we will set our z positive axis as pointing upwards. So expressing our gravitational acceleration in vector form, we can rearrange these three equations into just one vector equation. That will look as follows. We have the density term for the three equations. And this is multiplied by the material derivative of the x, y, and z components of the velocity vector. So we can write down the material derivative of the x, y, and z components of the velocity vector. Now this should be equal to partial change in pressure with respect to x minus partial change in pressure with respect to y in the y direction minus partial change in pressure with respect to z in the z direction. Since all of these three terms are negative, I'm going to factor out that negative one so I can have a sum inside. Let's keep in mind that each of these components has to be assigned to a direction. So any terms that come from my x direction equation will be multiplied by a unit vector i. Any terms that come from my y direction equation will be multiplied by the unit vector j. And any terms that come from my z direction will be multiplied by the unit vector k. Additionally, we need to consider the gravitational acceleration vector. We know that the gravitational vector is equal to negative gravitational acceleration times unit vector k. And because we have a negative sign in the z direction term, negative times negative will result in a positive term. So this is a simplify a vector form of our simplified momentum equations. But let's see what we have here. We have an x component of velocity in the x direction plus a y component of velocity in the y direction plus a z component of velocity in the z direction knowing that our velocity vector is simply the sum of its three components in its three respective directions then these three terms are actually just the velocity vector similarly we have the same operators applied into the pressure term we have partial over partial x partial over partial y in the j, and partial over partial z times k. That means that we can factor out, and factor is not really the right word because it's not a vector, but we can factor out the operator, partial over partial x in the i direction, 
plus partial over partial y in the j direction plus partial over partial z in the k direction. And we factor out this operator and apply it to the pressure. You may recognize that this operator is simply the del operator, also known as the gradient operator or nabla. Now, keeping these things in mind, we can simplify our equation and write a more condensed form of it. And there you have it. This is the Euler equation in its differential form. It actually looks really different from the equation we derived in the integral formulation. However, the equations actually mean the same thing. We have our density and acceleration term. We have negative del pressure, so that re represents our pressure terms. And then we have our weight term. This equation can be taken in unit mass terms by simply dividing the whole equation by density. This should leave us with an equation that relates the acceleration of a fluid element to the unit mass pressure term and the gravitational acceleration vector. This term, this term pressure divided by density is typically called in thermodynamic, is typically called the specific thermodynamic work. But we're not going to use this term in this lesson. However, you may see P over rho expressed as a variable W in your thermodynamic classes.